Chinese civilization originated in the basin surrounding the Yellow River and Yangtze River. For over 5,000 years, the Han Chinese and other ethnic groups lived together on this land, developing into what is today a vibrant and rich civilization. As Western missionaries arrived in China, their experiences and travels introduced Chinese culture to the world. Sinology thus became a popular area of study in the West, yet neighboring countries like Japan, Korea, and Vietnam have long been influenced by Chinese civilization in terms of politics, economics, and culture. The Japanese began to closely study China even earlier during the Sui and Tang dynasties. Today, leading sinologists from all around the world have made impressive inroads into the field. The 2018 Tang Prize in Sinology is awarded to Stephen Owen and Yoshinobu Shiba. Harvard Emeritus Professor Stephen Owen and Yoshinobu Shiba, the executive librarian at Tokyo Bunko, or Tokyo's Oriental Library, accepted the 2018 Tang Prize in Sinology from Academia Seneca Vice President Qingqing Huang, recognizing their immense contributions to the field of sinology. But I feel like we sound like I can't do it. The 72 year old Owen is an American professor who rose to prominence as a leading scholar of Tang poetry. Owen's translations and interpretations of Tang poetry redefined classical Chinese literature. Professor Tian and I were in Hong Kong. This was before the reunification. Uh, we were trying to get back to Kajidashi. We got a cab. The cab driver spoke no English. We spoke to him in Putonghua. Cab driver spoke no Putonghua. Cab driver had no idea what we want. So my bad. <laughs> I used tongue, we can the old tongue pronunciation. So I said, Kogi Tai Ha. Oh, Kogi Tai Ha. So it, yes, it's close enough, even though it's not exactly the same. On the topic of Tang poetry, Owen can talk for hours on end. Besides researching the sounds of ancient oral language during the Tang, he digs deeply to uncover the nature of the poets he studies and the creative environment they lived in. He is always ready to offer a comprehensive set of theories and interesting stories. In his classroom, poets who have been dead for over a thousand years seemingly come to life as if they were there to join the lesson. He has a, almost a magic, magic trick to make you, if you were sitting in his class, to make you feel like you were sitting uh, in Tang China or in Song China and, and he makes you feel like he actually know all these poets, know what he's talking about really well as if he personally knows them. He can take that poem and act it out and show you what is going on, what kind of person wrote it, what sort of um, mood they were in, you know, where the poem goes a little bit beyond what you expect, where it's not simply as flat as you think it might be. Um, and so he kind of brings poetry to life in the classroom. You feel that every fiber of steviness is going into understanding something that was written over a thousand years ago, and it has the effect of um, reviving someone who's dead. Owen, who has been described as an American born to study Tang poetry, was instantly drawn to Tang at age 14 when he read a book of ancient Chinese poems at the library. At 19, he enrolled in Yale University, where he became the first undergraduate to major in East Asian languages and civilization, and after getting his PhD at 26, he first taught at Yale, his alma mater, then at Harvard, spending a total of over 50 years teaching. At age 52, Harvard approached him as the James Bryan Conner University professor. He retired in 2018. He has written over 30 books so far and continues writing to this day. 
The best-known studies of Tang poetry include Owen's early book, The Poetry of Meng Chao and Han Yu, as well as works that he published over the course of several decades, including The Poetry of the Early Tang, The Great Age of Chinese Poetry, The High Tang, The End of the Chinese, Middle Ages, Essays in Mid-Tang Literary Culture, and The Late Tang, Chinese Poetry of the Mid-Ninth Century. Owen's research covers more than 300 years of poetry. He has read and reread thousands upon thousands of Tang poems. These poems portray life among intellectuals and upper classes during the Tang, as well as the historic and social changes that took place. I like Tang, because Tang is the world where you go, that moment when Chinese poetry went from being a court-centered, you know, very formal thing, to a generally widely shared social practice that really helped, you know, if we think of what a one man is, you know, in the Chutang, being a one man had nothing to do with writing poetry. By the Wantang, it was very much part of being a one man. So it helped build that notion of a one man. Yes, literature and history are related. Are they related in the way people usually think? That is, people think there's history, that literature reflects history. Maybe they're related in a different way. When we read a Tang poem, besides the beautiful language, there is much more to see. Take the popular Dufu poem, View in Spring, as an example. The state broken, its mountains and rivers remain. The city turns spring, deep with plants and trees. Stirred by the time, flowers sprinkling tears, hating parting, birds alarm the heart. Beacon fire stretched through three months. A letter from family worth 10,000 in Delper. I've scratched my white hair even shorter, pretty much to the point where it won't hold a hat pen. To truly understand Du's poem, Owen believes you must know the author's mental state and the social environment of the time. Translation is only the first step. The best approach is to examine all of Du's works to uncover more clues. When translating, Owen insists on preserving the beauty of the original text. His poetic translations flow, coming to life as if they were original creations written in English. He is a beautiful writer in English. Uh, and so you can give his books to undergraduate students or to people who don't have a pre-existing interest in Chinese literature, who don't know anything about the tradition. And he speaks to universal issues, to things that people care about across the world. Uh Besides researching Tang poetry, translation is another of Owen's major contributions to the study of classical Chinese literature. More than two decades ago, he published an anthology of Chinese literature. This book examines representative Chinese works, ranging from poetry to prose and fiction to drama, from the first millennium BC to the end of the imperial period in 1911. It is a must read for Western scholars interested in Chinese classics. At the age of 62, when most people are getting ready to retire, Owen turned his attention to translation. Over the course of eight years, he rendered all of Du Fu's 1,400 poems into English. The poems were published in a six-volume anthology that was also made available online for anyone to download free of charge. Yes, I thought of many year times over the years of doing translation of all Du Fu. But translating all Dufu is just too much stuff, too big. And then one day, I went to my mailbox, opened up the mail, and just learned that I was given a lot of money uh, from Mellon, and that I had to come up with a project to spend that money on. And I came up with several projects but one of them was to finish translating Dufu and to start a series 
of translations where you would have the Chinese on one side and the English on the other, so that people who could not read classical Chinese comfortably, and that is, I think, mainly one thing so low I. But there's a lot of Chinese too who read English more easily than they read classical Chinese. You could help you get closer to the Du Fu through the English. 通过他的书，通过他的翻呃翻译，通过他上课的讲解，嗯，杜甫真的被还原成了一个很丰富的人。其实你正是在全面的了解了他这个人之后，嗯。你才会觉得他那些诗为什么会成为中国诗学上的一个转折点？他为什么那么特别？他究竟跟其他的诗人不同在哪里 ？People read Du Fu, they read anthologies, and the anthologies are incredibly boring. I just I find them just awful. And Du Fu is such a very strange, quirky,、uh, different poet. If you actually read the whole thing, he writes a great deal about food.、And、nobody else writes as much about food in the Tang Dynasty as Du Fu. He writes about sashimi. Oh, they're always eating sashimi. You don't find this in Tang poetry. He writes poems to his slaves. He names his slaves. He's probably. Made as great a contribution as anyone of his generation to both introducing classical Chinese literature to the West、um, and to changing the way it's read around the world.、Um, he has about 15 monographs, which is、uh, an incredible number for any scholar,、um, and almost every one of them is a classic in its own right. His influence. Is everywhere, you know, in in this country, in the U.S., in Europe, in China, and in Taiwan. So many PhD dissertations are about Steve Owen, and and you could see the impact of his scholarship really very well. At the age of 72, Owen's passion for Tang poetry remains as strong as it was back when he first encountered Tang Dynasty poems at age 14. Besides reviving Tang poetry through his studies, Owen has introduced the West to the beauty of classical Chinese literature by showing how Chinese literature has contributed to the world's literary heritage. He revolutionized the field of comparative literature. Size of person versus the trunk. Owen happily shows us his yard, and in particular this tree, which is more than 300 years old. He lives near Harvard in a century-old house. The history of the home and its surroundings complements the wealth of knowledge that fills Owen's bookshelves. Among the books are classics of Latin and Greek literature. Owen began to study the languages of the world while in high school. He enjoyed the wonders of world literature. Yet it was the Chinese classics that he was most drawn to, and ended up spending a lifetime studying. His attraction could have been fate. In the 1960s, with the Cold War between the United States and Russia underway, few Westerners wanted to study modern Chinese, and even fewer showed an interest in ancient Chinese. But Owen insisted on his chosen path, even if he struggled to find employment. That would be better than spending a lifetime doing work that did not interest him. When I told them I wanted to study Chinese, my father said to my mother, "Are you willing to support him for the rest of your life?" They didn't think I could make a living. I did. <laughs> At Yale, I was the first person to do East Asian languages and civilizations as an under as a BA. And when I went there, the my advisor, the undergraduate advisor, says, "Don't do it." And I said, "But I'm going to do it." And he said, "No, I know you shouldn't." And I said, "I'm going to." I had to sort of fight to get into to be to be allowed to do it. In the long run, I ended up as chair of comparative literature at Harvard. But in the short run, I couldn't do comparative literature. <laughs> 
Owen uses strikingly original observations to situate classical Chinese literature in the greater context of world literature and its history. In the field of comparative literature, he is a true pioneer. Among his most popular books in comparative poetics are Remembrances, Milo, and Borrowed Stone. Well, I think that one of the things he did was um, to make the case that Chinese literature needed to be considered as part of world literature, not just modern literature influenced by the West, but as a literature that had an existence as part of the world of literature on its own. And that the study of comparative literature could not just be about Western literature or the literature of Mediterranean civilization, but could include East Asia as well. Borrowed Stone was jointly compiled by Owen and his wife, Tian Xiaofei, who, like her husband, is a Harvard professor. Besides both being leading scholars in the same field, they are best friends and excellent work partners. We decided to do this book because the, um, the press um, issued this invitation. They asked us to do a select number of essays, basically as a self-selection. I have to say that probably objectively speaking, he's not very easy to translate um, because he has this, his line of thinking is, um, he has a very original and sometimes counterintuitive. Um, and so I would say, objectively speaking, he's probably not the easiest person to translate. Um, but um, I feel that I do have an advantage because I know him so well. I know his way of thinking so well. Professor Tian is her own person. We don't always agree. We share things, we, we share, but she is her own, you know, her own scholar who's published as many books at her age as I published by that age, you know, she's, or maybe more because of the Chinese books. I feel very lucky that um, we love the same kind of things, we, you know, we're interested in the same kind of things. We often have very different opinions about things, but one um, important thing, I think, for any relationship, you know, uh, for husband and wife, for, you know, best of friends, you know, which we are best of friends of each other, is that we always talk to each other. I respect her as a scholar, uh, and we, lead, we allow, try to allow a separate space here so that you know, she has her office, I have my office. We share, yes, we sh send books back and forth, but that's a natural collegial thing to do. <laughs> so do I, I also give him the full respect. I think he's a very, um, as a person, he's a very generous person. He has generosity of spirit. And that's one of the things I admire and respect in him. Now that I'm teaching myself, uh, I realize all the effort that went into his classes behind the scenes. Um, every semester, he would essentially write and translate an entire book of Chinese literature and give it to the students as background reading, background information. Um, so he would give you a course packet of 500 pages of his own translations with essays and um, supplementary material that we did not even know that there was such a thing as office hours. We thought that you, when you uh, wanted to talk to your teacher, you just went up to the office and knocked on the door. You would walk into his office with great dismay and with almost depressed, uh, almost like really feeling really uh, helpless and frustrated by whatever you're doing. And then you, will, you would uh, walk out of his office really happy, excited, and like laughing and really ready and excited to start writing and continue what. When Owen retired in April 2018, former students who see him as both a teacher and a father figure traveled from the U.S., Europe, Japan, Taiwan, and China to bid farewell. More than 100 scholars attended his retirement ceremony. Yale professor Kang Yi Shun Chang even wrote a poem to celebrate the occasion. Stephen Owen Rongxiu, 
土物吞咽，银剑桥。OK， 唐英北美逞风骚，仰搔寒渡麻姑爪，喜配凤鸾弄玉箫。舌颤里桃四十载，笔耕英汉万千条。感君助我修诗史，恭贺荣修得西敖。Yeah, so, so I, it was really fun to contribute, you know, this poem, you know, to um to Stephen Owen because he really means a lot to our field. And also means a lot to me. This is Tan San Sai. And what's interesting here, if this is genuine, this is really important. Because look what you see. What's this? Bubble? Uh huh. Yeah, it is. What's, what's, what's the bubble mean? Oh, smoke. smoke no. No. It means music. Bubble means music. Uh, how do you, oh. she's playing in this musical instrument? You oh, see, okay. they're playing musical instruments. How do you represent music in the Tang Dynasty visually? Oh. Now I, I don't I don't know if this is genuine or not. That's why I think if it is genuine, that's actually really important. Even through his hobby of collecting ancient relics, Owen is able to unearth clues that offer a glimpse into ancient Chinese civilizations. Owen takes great joy in uncovering the mysteries of the Tang period. He has spent his life building channels that open up dialogue with the past. Despite having been born in the West, Owen has a closer connection to the Tang dynasty than any other living person in the world. The Toyo Bunko, or the Oriental Library located in Tokyo, is Japan's largest and oldest Asian studies library and the fifth largest such library in the world. There are about one million books in its collection. The executive librarian who is tasked with overseeing this library and research institute, Yoshinobu Shiba, is the co-recipient of the 2018 Tang Prize in Sinology. This space is Shiba's office. Every day he is here pouring over copious amounts of material. His primary focus is the economic history of China, which is the very field that he has devoted nearly 70 years of his life to. Sibo先生做的是那个宋代商业史 in middle school, Shiba was interested in the history of social transformation in Germany and even studied German. However, his father, a philosophy professor, told Shiba that to truly study a country's history, he had to examine a large volume of primary resources to find evidence to support his arguments. Shiba's father asked whether it would be better to concentrate on the neighboring country of China. This recommendation changed both Shiba's academic focus and his life. Shiba went on to study Oriental history at the University of Tokyo. Under the tutelage of Yoshiyuki Sudo, Shiba became involved in the annotated translation of the food and money chapter of the Song history. This endeavor provided a solid foundation in the study of Song economic history. In 1968, because of Shiba's publication of Commerce and Society in Song China, he was quickly recognized as a leading academic figure in the field. Sipo 
あのすごく限界と言いましょうかあの資料っていうのはもう限られてますからあの自分が知りたいことについての資料があるとは限らないんですね。でその時にどうやったらそういうところにあの、えっと、アプローチというか接近できるかっていう時に例えば司馬先生のような方法論っていうのはあのすごくあの参考になる。Considering China's long history, why focus on the Song Dynasty? Were there commercial developments at that time which changed Chinese history and society? Xi Ba searches for answers in local chronicles as well as official and personal documents. He created charts and maps to show the development of transportation systems as well as markets and commercial planning through systematic exploration of the relationships between cities and towns and national and commercial entities. Shiba gradually built a comprehensive picture of Song economic history. His work carved out a new field of research. Hanmu 因為民間的經濟不會完全受制於貴族、外資，以至到一些有功的大臣。其實，西伯山切進去的那個題目，在宋代的研究，它是非常精準的一個切進去。中國的經濟史很難做研究，差不多是財政史。而且，西伯先生慢慢就注重在下層、下一層的。资料，这个文书、文件，呃，商人的，呃，锦鲤书。China is enormous, with a huge population to match its size. With economic activity taking place all over the country, scholars must determine whether changes in one region are reflective of the country as a whole. Shiba quickly recognized the limitations of traditional sinology. He incorporated Western social science research methods with empirical traditions from Japanese sinology. In his 1988, a study of the economic history of Jiangnan in the Song, to show how waterways were a dominant force behind regional economic development of China's interior. Jiangnan 那个经济是要把它移到那个洛阳、长安去，支持王朝的发展。所以宋开封也好，啊，南宋当然更厉害了，它完全是在那个杭州嘛。那到了以后的朝朝廷都是在北京啊，那变成南宋那个运河就通到北京。一路至到今天，長江流域仍然是最重要。江南那個經濟有一條長江水，我把內地所有的經濟都往往往沿海那邊送。陸上交通は一番そうなんですよね。そういう効率よくない。だから水上交通はその三倍か四倍は安く物を運べる。早くです。しかも。To examine Chinese merchants and better understand regional economic activities, Shiba studied a large volume of historic materials from a wide range of sources. From these data, he learned about China's urban development models. In 2002, Shiba presented a unique set of interpretations in his new book, A History of Chinese Towns and Cities. Shiba says that he 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 says 大聚落的围墙啊，它重点在于政治性、镇压、统治的功能跟军事上防御的功能。都市的都呢，指的是都会，英文叫 emporium 啊，也就是说重要的贸易、商业活动的地方。普通の人はみんなそのそこら中村があると思ってる。あの闘争もそうだけどその前もね、だけどそんなことはないって。嗯，村っていうのは。あの記録に残るようになってきたのはね、南北朝、うん南米南米朝であって、それまではまあ
田舎には住まなかったんであの、うん、それでですから村って字そのものが新しい字新しい字なんですよ。在一九七七年其实在那个呃 William Skinner 的那个编的书里面也就写过像宁波啦等等这一类的城市。那可是他为什么到了那个二零零二年的样子才出版了？他的那个城市史书，前后这样就二十多年过去，这其实也是斯波先生做研究的一个态度，就是说他常常把问题看了、想了，放在心里面，慢慢的在长年累月的阅读中间啊，形成他成熟的看法，呃，充实他的这些资料，然后呢，他到了时机成熟才把它写出来。Economic activity among the general populace fuels urban progress. According to Shiba, the prefectural capital of Tainan, as introduced in his book on Chinese urban history, is an excellent example of this theory. To further investigate, he visited Tainan several times. China, a dictator comes in, then he is set up here. He is set up and is set up. But he is not a traditional Chinese king. He is a king. 它还是以商业、海外的商业贸易为主的一个政权，特别到正经那个时间，他就会去金门啊这些地方去做沿海的贸易。但是它又具有中国性格的一个一个架构在里面。那这样这样一个，如果你研究中国的话，你跑台南市，这很容易就跑完了。台南在日本人来以前，它本来就是那个城市，就是有城的嘛，啊，所以就是有城门呐，啊，所以他师伯老师在演讲里面就讲有四个城门，就就满足了这个民众的需求，像譬如说东门城，很多的植物，呃，笋子啦，那个蔬菜都从那边进来，那个是因为他出去就是仁德归仁嘛。日本人来以后，他就把城墙拆掉了，就变成用那个棋盘式的近代国家，啊，就就有两个圆环、三个圆环这样这样发展出去，那整个都市的发展就不太一样啊。Shiba has long observed the urbanization and commercial development of China. He also researches overseas Chinese by examining Chinatowns found around the world. He has learned that no matter where they go, the Chinese are very enterprising. Putting their skills and expertise to work, they carve a niche wherever they go. Their interpersonal relationships and commercial dealings are woven like a spider web. In one sense, overseas Chinese are an economic entity that springs up in response to market needs. This is another one of Shiba's important academic discoveries. 大概十八世纪以前，出外的中国人，男生为主，很少女生。那你跟刘结婚的，那你跟当地的女生结婚，生了三一代了就变成万学的中国人，他们呢就会维持了中国人的生活习惯，但他已经非常原住民化了。那这些人到今天，他们认为，哇，我也是有华裔血统。如果不是的话，新加坡华人他们一般叫我是华人，泰国我叫华人，啊，马来西亚我叫华人。他很少说华裔，不，呃，西伯先生讲华裔跟华侨把它分开，他的意思就希望我们不要把它混混混淆在一起，因为否则的话就会使得一种误会产生。西伯先生以一个不是以研究海外华人为为主的的那个研究者，但是他对这些问题有蛮深刻独到的看法。那这个主要原因是日本对于。那个华侨史的研究，其实也有它漫长的历史。就从我们刚才讲过，明治维新以来的这个新的日本的史学传统里面，华侨史研究也是当中很重要的课题。Shiba understands that a thousand-mile journey starts with a single step. He is not like the traditional researcher who only analyzes official records and documents. Rather, he uses anthropologic and folklore research methods that became popular in the 1950s in Western academic circles. This approach is rare among Japanese sinologists. Sensei was, ah, Japan の学会では比較的長く恵まれなかったんだね。東京大学にもっと早く入るべきだったね。うん、もっと東大教授は早くならなきゃいけないね本当に
あのここで尊重されてたとしたら、はい、だからタンプライズもそういう意味では、はいまあ、非常に喜んでおられるんじゃないかと思いますけど。Despite the lack of recognition and accolades in the past, Shiba always pushed ahead with this research. With the discipline reminiscent of an ascetic monk, he quietly absorbs a large amount of Chinese historic data. He also had the foresight to combine Western research methods with the tradition of academic rigor common among the Japanese. Shiba does not have a high volume of published writings, but he put his heart and soul into each work, opening new paths for future academics. On this auspicious day, believers from local temples tote banners marching together towards Sha Dao Temple to offer birthday wishes to San Tai Zi. Believers from the four temples alternate entering the temple's inner sanctuary to offer incense to the god. Practitioners see each other as brothers, visiting one another and lending a hand when one needs help. In Tainan's traditional culture, each temple has a jing or a district it operates in. This concept is a key component of Shiba's research into the city. Hayo 台南市的城市发展的特别的历史的一部分建教的时候说弄那个不见天那不见天所到的话我们就是他庙的建啊有很多庙会打架就是说我的庙我认为我的庙道这边是我不见天就到这边那别的庙觉得不是啊就会这样
After Shiba and his colleagues cleaned up, they were intent on returning to their homes. But the subway was out of service and traffic links were cut off. Shiba walked more than five hours to his home in Saitamakan. One way that Shiba eases the pressure of his research and administrative tasks is by raising Java sparrows. At one time, he had as many as 16 birds. Shiba likes to plant flowers and raise birds. He has even started to grow vegetables. In private, Shiba is mild-tempered and well-mannered. He supports students and youths. In his professional life, he is a conscientious, serious worker. His students sometimes find him intimidating, but most are grateful for his guidance. Yasashi或者是柔軟,但是其實真的是嚴苛。に迷う Despite being one of Japan's top sinologists, Shiba is very modest. He is usually soft-spoken and friendly, but can be decisive and bold when needed. He successfully led a transformation at Toyo Bunko. When the library faced a financial crisis, Shiba found corporate support so that the institute could continue to operate. With the change in operational model, the library was given a new life. In academia, Shiba is considered an excellent listener. He respects opposing opinions and refrains from personal criticism. After dedicating most of his life to Sinology, Shiba still has unfulfilled ambitions. Recently, he has been conducting research for an e-dictionary. He has also gathered a group of young academics who are making digital copies of Chinese reference books that previously had to be reprinted or copied. Even after reaching old age, Shiba is sparing no effort to advance Sinology in Japan. The Tong Prize Foundation invited both Stephen Owen and Yoshinobu Shiba to Taiwan. Owen spoke to students at National Taiwan Normal University, and Shiba spoke at National Chenggong University. Why aren't we reading just the famous poems? And I asked them, when did the famous poems become famous? Begin with the small things. And taken together, those small things may lead to large things. But the large things may be not what you expect. Everyone knows 
At the lecture, similar to Owen's classes, he stimulates new lines of thought among the audience. Using Wang Wei's poetry as an example, he urges people to cast off the shackles of traditional thinking and find the clues hidden in the poem's small details. Several weeks before this lecture, Owen even visited Lantian County, Shanxi, where the Wang Quanji or Wheel River collection of poems was written. He wanted to understand what life was like there more than 1,000 years ago when these poems were written. Shiba, meanwhile, pre-recorded a speech to share with students and teachers at National Chenggong University. Shiba is naturally careful, thoughtful, and considerate. He is a master in his field, yet he remains modest and open-minded. Tainan Shiba, now 88, and Owen, now 72, have passionately dedicated their lives to studying the vast world of Chinese literature and history. Combining careful observation with original views, these scholars form a bridge between contemporary society and the golden age of the Tang and Song dynasties, providing valuable knowledge that helps us respond to the changing world we live in today.